Over a month ago now, I made a video reacting to my subscribers' piano playing. And at the time, there was quite a lot of people that sent me their playing. But since then, the list has only gotten longer. So today, we're going to get through some more of them. And if you want to send me your playing for a future video, then the link is in the description. Let's get into it. Okay, first up, we have Mitchell. This video is from his first piano recital when he'd been playing for eight months. He's now been playing for over a year and he's playing Liebestraum number three by Liszt. Nice. For a very short space of time, Mitchell plays very, very well. So the interesting thing about Liszt and Liszt's playing is that he was around in the Romantic period and he was a pianist and a very good pianist. So he wrote pieces that sound quite easy, but they're actually really quite difficult. And the reason that this particular piece is quite difficult is because the melody is shared between two hands. So in this particular piece, you start with the melody in the left hand and then the right hand takes over and then the left hand and then the right hand. And it's quite difficult to make that melody sound like one coherent thing. Liszt actually does exactly the same thing in one of my favourite piano pieces, which is Unsuspiro, which goes something like this. It's a very difficult technique to master and because as a listener you're hearing just a melody it sounds quite straightforward but as a player you've got to be really in control of your fingers to make it sound simple particularly as it says in the music dolce cantando which means sweet and singing and i actually think mitchell has done a really good job at getting this to come across the key of this piece is A flat major. So the piece starts on an A flat major chord, which is not unexpected. But then after that, you get four bars where you get something called a dominant seventh. Now in music, the word dominant just means number five. So note number five in a scale or chord number five in a scale, which means in each of these bars, we're hearing something kind of unexpected because we're changing key every bar. Also at the start, the bass notes are descending by one note at a time. So as soon as that pattern is broken and it jumps down, it feels really warm. The other interesting thing about these chords at the beginning is this C that's at the top that stays there the entire time. So the first chord is this, the second chord is this, third chord, and then fourth chord, and then fifth chord and then it finally changes to go back to the beginning so these three features which is a series of dominant seventh chords the bass note descending and then jumping down and that c staying at the top all give this piece a lot of character as well as the fact that you're trying to play a melody in between all of this split between your hands and you've got to try and get that melody to sing out when you're playing lots of other notes in the same hand if i was going to say anything i would say listen to the quality of the chords and use rubato in order to express the chords because the melody is telling the story but the chords tell you how to feel about that story Okay, next up we have Untitled Piano, who is playing La Campanella and thinks that they might need help with tension.
Nice. La Campanella is a very difficult piece to learn. So once again, great job at learning it. There is a couple of things you can do about tension in your hands, especially when playing things like this, where you've got to play fast repeated notes. The first thing I would suggest is when you are playing black notes in this particular piece, I would use fingers one and four instead of one and five, because if you're using one and five all the time, it's tempting to lock your hand into place like that and then it makes it very difficult to play. Using one and four as well as one and five as well means you don't have to travel as much. If you're using one and five, you're having to jump around quite a lot, whereas one and four allows you to kind of move a lot less. The other thing I would say about this kind of piece, and I have had to do this a lot with a lot of different pieces that require difficult repetitions, is that when you're practicing it, you've got to build in moments where you are deliberately releasing tension. So for this particular section in the left hand, it might be on those octaves in the bass. Where you're almost training it into your hand to let go every time you play those bass notes. And in the right hand, So between the two, you've trained it into your hands when to release. It's also worth stopping on those places to make sure your wrist is really loose. The last thing I would say to think about is where the pivot point is. And the pivot point for repeated notes like this is your wrist. So if your fingers are stuck in place, that's okay as long as your wrist is able to move. And you can just practice doing this all day long. Trying to make sure that your wrist is constantly mobile. But nice job. La Campanella is not an easy piece. Okay, next up we have Adam, who started piano at the age of six, but didn't really care too much until they turned 16. And now he's grinding out Claire de Lune. Very nice. We've got some really great players today. A couple of things that I would say is one, be careful with rubato. You don't want to go too extreme with pushing and pulling the time. Adam did exactly the right thing, which is to push the speed a little bit and then pull it back as if it's tapering off. But you don't want to be too extreme with it. So you don't want to do something like this. Instead, it wants to feel like it's nudging forward and then pulling back slightly. It needs to feel a little bit more nervous and tentative. And then here it can start to warm up. I really love this piece. The second thing is, is that Adam fell into the trap that I mentioned in the last video. The key to this is that after that first page, you're expecting this. But you actually don't get that. You get the opposite of that. It almost reminds me of when you look at something bright and you kind of want to shy away from it.
You've got to feel the beauty of it rather than the grandeur of it. But once again, really great playing and this is really not an easy piece either. But for very different reasons, it's not technical reasons, it's more emotional reasons and really being able to connect to the meaning of the piece and then being able to reflect that in how you play it. Okay, next up we have George who goes to music school, has been playing for four years and likes to play classical. <laughs> Once again, great playing and a very difficult piece. Now, this is Ratmanov's Prelude in C-sharp minor, and I have actually played this and performed this lots of times. So the first thing I would say is at the beginning where you've got these series of chords, you want to try and balance the hands so that the top notes of the chords stands out more. This is just to give the ear something to latch onto and make it sound slightly more melodic than just a series of chords. Also, you want to try and create quite a bit of suspense in this first page because it's quite a dramatic piece. And because it's essentially based around these three notes and all the chords kind of lead back to those notes, you want to potentially use rubato and stretch the time a little bit in order to make these feel like they're always leading back to the C sharp. So there's no need to hurry this entire section because you want to build that drama so that when you get to the middle section where you've got a load of fast notes, you've kind of set the atmosphere so that then the fast notes can change that atmosphere. And then when you get the fast notes, you don't want to lose the idea of the melody because although there's lots of notes happening, you want to hear the top note of each of the chord shapes. So. Because while all the fast notes are happening, that's going to be the thing that an audience are going to be able to hear and latch onto, and the fast notes will just make it sound more manic and impressive. Kind of like this.
I got a little bit carried away there. So you want to keep some semblance of melody intact. And also, don't get too fast too soon, because otherwise it all just sounds like a load of notes. Whereas if you build into that speed, you almost build the tension for the audience. So by the time you get to those massive chords at the end of that fast section, it sounds really huge. Yeah, so with this last section, just be careful with the counting because you're supposed to go one, two, three, four, one, two. So you get the bass notes on one and then the chords held for two, three, and four. The other thing with this section is that those C sharps build so much intensity as they hold underneath everything else. Whenever I have performed this piece, I've always treated this part as a sort of challenge to see how silent I can make the audience. Because with this particular piece, there's so much chaos and big massive chords. And then at the end, it just feels really still and tense because of those repeated notes. So it's a bit of a roller coaster, but it's a very difficult piece to play, so very, very well done. Okay, next up we have Bolash, or he said to call him Simon, so we'll go with Simon. So Bolash started playing when he was nine, and he's now 37 and teaches at a basic level. So we have Claire de Lune again. It's a very popular piece. Once again, plays it very well. We've got a video full of great players today. And I'm almost reluctant with this one to offer too much advice because he plays it technically very well and he's made a lot of great decisions about how to play it. But I do feel like the sections where Simon is pushing the tempo are pushed, for my taste, a little bit too much. Here 
in the music, it's marked un poco mosso, which means a little motion. And for me, a little is the most important part of that because you want to feel like this section of the music is rolling forward. There's a lot more movement in the left hand. But this part is by no means the peak of the piece. So for me, it needs to be held back slightly. Also throughout this section, you get some really interesting chords. For example, you get this chord. But then it brightens up to this chord. And those kind of moments where you get unusual chords that brighten or dim the sound, you want to really be able to hear. And a lot of the time you can do that by slowing down and pushing and pulling the tempo. If you play through it slightly too quick, then you're at risk of missing those opportunities to bring out those sounds. Opposed to... But once again, these are preferences, and I don't think Simon is playing this without knowing these things. But hopefully that offers an alternative perspective, which might be something to think about. Okay, next up we have Jacob, who is 23 and self-taught, and one day would like to be able to play Nocturne Opus 48 number one. And one day he also hopes to get an acoustic piano. Nice, so this is Chopin's Waltz in A minor. A couple of things to think about here. Usually when there are repetitions in a piece of music, the dynamic doesn't stay the same, and dynamic is just the volume that you play at. Usually, if we are to repeat a phrase, we want to treat it either like an echo, so therefore the second time wants to be quieter, or like it's reinforcing the idea, so the second time wants to be louder. And in this particular case, after the first eight bars, the second time when it repeats, it's got to be quieter. So the first time, you can maybe give it more presence. But then the second time, try and make it feel like it's pulling away a little bit. Also, because it's a waltz, which is a partner dance, you want a strong first beat and a weak second and third beat, so you get... So be careful that you don't pedal through all of that because you only want to pedal the gap and then leave these two chords more separate. They don't want to be entirely separated and played staccato, but at the same time, you want them to feel light and bouncy. Because if you were to dance to this, you'd want a strong beat one and then a light and bouncy beat two and three. All of the players in today's video were really great. And if you want to send me your video for me to react to, then the link is in the description. All of the players in the last video that I did as well were really great. And if you want to see that, then head on through and I will see you there.